All right. Um, good to be here. Um, and today I wanted to kind of share with you a little bit about some of the problems we've been working on at Quid and um, some of the things that we've actually been able to build um, from that. So we'll kind of run through pretty quick fire and kind of see what's going on. For those that don't really know about Quid, um, we're a 55-person company down in uh, San Francisco um, building um, global intelligence platforms to help people make better decisions in this complex world. Uh, we've raised $40 million in uh, financing and we're currently working with some of the biggest um, corporate clients and governments um, from around Around the world. And um, there's been a lot of talk, I guess, at this, um, at this conference and, of course, over the last couple of years about this concept of big data. And a lot of that is kind of focused on the idea of how do we store it, how do we access it, you know, how do we um, sell better ads on Facebook as a result of it. But there's another part of the story, and that's really how do we use this data to make big decisions? How do we use this data to kind of figure out important um, things going on in the world around us? And so when we work with our clients, there's questions like, you know, what should my energy strategy be um, in the next 10 years? Or should I be worried about uh, Chinese cyber weapons um, in, in, in terms of national security? And it's these kinds of questions that we try and get data um, in to kind of answer. And we try and do that by using um, our intelligence platform to do it. The problem we've got is that we live in a complex world, and the world around us is not an easy thing to really wrap our heads around. There's a lot of interacting parts, a lot of um, feedback loops that make it really difficult for us to understand. And so when we think about um, this from, from our perspective, we've got, on the one hand, kind of a complex world, on the other hand, a kind of you know, human version 1.0 sitting next to it. And you know, we grew up on the, the sort of the human ancestry on the, the African plains, kind of three-dimensional, four-dimensional world, and we've got to get a head around a, a massively dimensional system. And so you can kind of think about this as a kind of a dimensionality problem. On the one hand, you've got the uh, massively dimensional global systems that we all reside in. And on the other hand, you have the kind of the finite human capacity to understand it all. And so how do we um, kind of attack this? Well, the first thing we can do is kind of dimensionality reduction. We can take the kind of the information that exists within the world and kind of reduce it down to something a little more manageable. On the other side, we can kind of use the gifts that we've got as humans to tell stories and to kind of see patterns and visualizations and use that to kind of boost our own um, capacity to understand dimensionality. And that kind of that middle spot there is kind of where Quid is as a software platform. And so we make you know, a lot of use of um, mathematics to kind of do this. And this is um, a Hofmap projection from um, String Theory. And I recommend if you're going to start a, a big data company, you should have um, at least one string theorist on board. And we have a couple. And what this really shows is that you can kind of take a high dimensional space and reduce it down without losing information integrity as you do it. And this is kind of the game that we're in. So that's the, sort of the complex version of it. The simple thing is, you know, step one, we collect a lot of documents. And these documents could be anything from um, news, news reports, they could be government um, filings, or they could even be things like job ads and uh, um, Facebook status updates. Once we've got them, we need to do named entity recognition on top of that to extract all the entities that are important from it. And so we're able to do that here and get pretty good um, scores in both precision and recall um, from all the important entities. Now, the entities could be people, places, organizations. Once we've got the entities out, we then do multi-document search on top of that to find all the other documents where that entity is mentioned. And so for something like Pfizer, this is what that would look like. And we've got a list of um, all the documents associated with that company. What we can then do is um, take the, this kind of bunch of information and then look to kind of reduce the dimensionality down even further. And the first thing we're looking for is explicit connections. Does A interact with B? And this could be a product partnership or it could be something um, more competitive like suing um, the company across, um, you know, company A would sue company B. The second thing we look for is an implicit connection. Now, this is different from an explicit connection insofar as you could have a, a solar company in India using a very similar technology to a solar company in China. They've never actually interacted with each other, but they're connected because they've got the same underlying technology between them. And then the third thing we look at is kind of saying, well, how important is the entity that we're looking at? You know, what's its growth through time? And to do that, we, we need to kind of track um, a set of metrics that can kind of give us um, a high relationship with um, the, the size or the importance of that entity within it. Now, this gives us a set of building blocks that we can then use to do some pretty cool things. And we've got 75,000 um, entities in the technology space, 400,000 significant events, um, 1.5 million meaningful engrams, and around a trillion dollars in, um, in uh, market um, transactions. And so we can then put that into the software and say, well, let's go and have a look. Let's say we're interested in the energy space. And so the energy space here, we, we go in and we create a search for energy. We can kind of refine that to build a set of um, entities that we're kind of interested in. 
we then go in and generate um, a network from that. And that network um, will allow us to see all the different relationships that exist within this. Now, it doesn't just give us a static network. It actually gives us a network that's kind of time-sliced so we can see an evolution. And what we're able to do now is to sit down and say, well, how did the energy ecosystem evolve over the last decade? How do we take all the millions of documents that are written about the energy space, extract all the entities, understand all the events, and see it play out? And so we can see here um, now what that looks like. As you can see, starting off here, the dots represent um, companies and research labs. Um, they're kind of coming in as they get formed. The, um, the red information there is indicating funding and growth um, within it. And you can start to see um, the kind of the ecosystem evolve and the clusters emerge. The names um, are the names that are auto automatically generated to attach onto the clusters um, as we see them kind of come. So we can see down here in 2004 and 5. We can already see biofuels and recycling, energy generation, smart grid, solar energy, energy storage, and then lighting start to emerge. And the system sort of starts to evolve and take shape, and again, it's processing all the documents and interactions that kind of go with it. And this is really kind of quite beautiful um, as you see it kind of emerge and the energy ecosystem start to take structure. And by the time we get to sort of 2007, we start to hit the, um, the start of the recession, and you see the kind of the, uh, the amount of red and the funding kind of starts to drop off. Um, but the system starts to kind of organize itself. As 2008 comes along, we're right in the middle of the recession, but we start to see the kind of the impact um, emerge of the uh, Department of Energy and government funding going to the system, which is also matched by um, large-scale funds like Vineyard Coastler's um, Cleantech Fund starting to emerge. And so in 2009, we now see quite a mature um, energy ecosystem dominated by things like smart grid down there with, with um, the green representing large-scale acquisitions by companies like um, Silver Spring Networks. And so 2010 rolls, and then we see um, a lot of activity in a very mature market, and the yellow is starting to indicate now um, the emergence of IPOs that come from within that. And so we see IPOs for Sarah, for um, Bright Source Energy, um, for Silver Spring Networks, and, of course, for uh, Solyndra, down in the um, solar energy space. So what we've done there really is kind of um, a dimensionality manipulation. We're able to take a um, large number of documents and kind of reduce it down for human consumption. And you can see an entire decade of a, of a very complex space emerge and structure emerge kind of from within that. But we also want to be able to kind of zoom in and see what's going on at kind of a higher level resolution. And we can zoom into that and see now um, the, uh, the solar network in kind of three dimensions here. And we can see the kind of six major clusters emerge. And the first thing that you see is the amount of um, entities in the concentrated solar thermal space. Um, if we resize this by funding, you can see there's a huge amount of capital that has been put into this concentrated solar thermal. This is big um, kind of arrays of mirrors shining light up onto uh, central points to power things by heat. Um, interestingly, too, as you've got the finance and the systems integration space, kind of indicative of the fact that, you know, you need to bring solar into line. Um, it costs a lot of money, and there's a lot of um, systems integration to do with that. The thin film space is particularly interesting when we resize this by between the centrality because we can start to see the elements um, within that that are kind of connecting together multiple different clusters. Now, we can zoom in on that space one more time, and we can see three kind of entities that emerge as being very, very interesting. Um, Ying Li, Green Energy, um, First Solar, and Solyndra all have very high between the centrality, indicating their kind of importance within the ecosystem. So we can zoom in um, on that, and we see um, the sort of 12 different clusters in the thin film space emerge. And these 12 different clusters broadly kind of correlate with the different technologies that are used to kind of create um, the thin films that we see. And so we can kind of go down on that and say, well, Solyndra and um, First Solar um, are two things that actually occupy different parts of that cluster. And Solyndra making use of um, SIGS technology, which is non-silicon reliant, and, and First Solar actually making use of cadmium telluride, which is very silicon um, reliant. And we can zoom in one more time and actually look at the, um, the significant events that have happened for both of those entities. And we can start to get a story now of why Solyndra sort of started to get itself into trouble. And we can see Solyndra here taking a DOE grant, um, a loan, um, and which required it to kind of put its first factory in the US. We can also see it being exposed to the uh, falling silicon prices around the world. 
and we can see across on the other side on First Solar, we can see that it's able to kind of put its manufacturing plant in Malaysia. It's able to achieve a dollar per watt based on the uh, falling silicon prices. And interestingly enough, in 2009, in January, the chief scientist um, from uh, Solyndra actually makes the move across to First Solar. So what we're able to do there is we're able to go with all those documents go from the very high level of how does an energy ecosystem evolve. We can pick a space like um, solar and zoom into it. We can look at thin films and zoom into that again. We can zoom right down to the company level details and see the movement of people backwards and forwards. And for every single dot on every single part of that, of that energy space, and indeed any technology space, we can do this the same again and again. And it really gives you a chance to go and play with the data, immerse yourself in complex spaces, and come to a space of better decisions. So we're quid, um, we're augmenting um, our ability to perceive this complex world, and um, hopefully you hear a lot more from us in the next coming years. Thank you. <laughs>